There's signs and symbols everywhere, all around us. Thank you to the, all of you on the worship team for putting up these symbols, symbols of anticipation, of repentance, of reflection. But there are things that are absolute signs, stop signs, stop. And then there are symbols, there are wedding rings, Confederate flags, rainbow flags, a hijab, a rainbow, a baptism, all symbols that point to something. We can look up the definition of each of these, and there is a clearly defined, you know, uh, definition. You should never use the same word in a definition to define it. I know that. <laughs> But if I asked each of you to define these symbols, to describe them, you would have something personal to say. Perhaps that's the difference of a, between a sign and a symbol. They appeal to more than just our inter intellect. They register emotions, it, memories of events that fed us and that bring us back to times of trial. What can bring warmth to one person might trigger a terrible memory or pain for another. Symbols have power. And I know they only have power because it's the power that we give them. But how many of you ignore these symbols? How many of you have know about France and how it has worked itself into a legal and intellectual frenzy since 1989? They're still arguing this regarding l'affaire du voile, the, and these are arguments over what face and head coverings an Islamic woman might may wear. Symbols have power. In our readings today, we find two symbols rainbow and baptism. These are symbols familiar to all of us, and they point us in known directions. Noah and his family and all the animals that he could squeeze into the ark disembark from this ark after spending hundreds of days aimlessly floating as the result of a globally devastating flood. God had had enough of humanity. After giving humans various choices to get it right, it seems that God was ready for humans 2.0. Yet when the waters subside, God doesn't ask what the Noah family had learned from this brutal object lesson. Nor did God ask what their plans were to continue to make things right. When God smells the savory aroma of Noah's burnt offering, God makes a covenant with humans and all the creations of the earth. Back in Genesis 8, it is written, Never again will I curse the ground because of humans, even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood. And never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. As long as the earth endures seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. God goes on to promise that nothing like this will ever happen again. And the reminder of this promise is the rainbow. Now, the bow had always been there, but now it's a symbol. It's there to remind all of God's um, promises never to destroy everything again with such a horrible flood. It's as if God had a change of heart. God created the world and made it a beautiful place for all the creatures, including the human creatures. But almost immediately, for those humans, it wasn't enough because they wanted to be like God. But not being God 
When they tried to behave like God, everything began to unravel. Now, if you were raised with this story, you probably focused on the animals marching two by two or Noah's faithfulness and how he stood up to the naysayers who refused to listen to God and do the right thing. Or perhaps you learned about a bird that left the ark a few times before it returned with a branch. Or perhaps you just learned about God's promise in the beauty of the rainbow. Yet the phenomenal cosmic power in the wrath of God leading to the destruction of everything in the holy creation might have been glossed over. It's pretty bad news. Well, we might have heard God knew what was best for everyone. And well, people didn't listen and they were sinful. And there are ways of God's that are a mystery. Now, these explanations leave us with a power paradigm that doesn't fit with an understanding of a God who creates, who loves, who offers grace, who is sacrificial. I mean... I, I heard this story when I was little, and I always wondered, I can't believe people decorate their nurseries with Noah's Ark. <laughs> Do they know the whole story? Now, this, this, project, this glossing over projects, I mean, of, of this of a God, um, projects a model of a God that is immutable, unknowable, never changing. And it's not really true to scripture. As an Old Testament professor of mine used to say, just stick with the words. You'll find the meaning. But back in Genesis 8, God says, I'm not going to do this again. Even though humans are inclined to do that which is evil, even from an early age, it's as if God threw a fit, and God broke everything. And then sitting around in the rubble, God looked around and realized that what God was expecting of humanity really wasn't possible. Could it be that God may have made a mistake? Could it be that God's mind was changed? Just because humans wanted to be like God, they're never going to get there. So God promised the rhythms of life would always be present, not just for humans. God's covenant was for all the animals of the earth, domestic and wild, all the birds of the air, and for humans. They're all going to be reminded that God's rage will be kept at bay. In Mark's gospel, we read of Jesus' baptism. As I've said before, Mark is the Marie Kondo of gospel writers. It seems there are just not that many words that sparked him with great joy. Where Luke and Matthew tell us all about the temptations that Jesus faces and his faithful refusal to indulge himself, Mark just tells us, and he was tempted by Satan. Fair enough. With this brevity in mind, it's very important that we pay attention to the fact that Mark included, and he was with the wild beasts. The angels waited on him. When I think about this, I don't know. I'm reading into the scripture, but I think about the fact that Mark doesn't tell us anything about Jesus' early life. We learn about this, and we're told that he's off with the wild beasts. And I think about all of us, all the wild beasts that tempt us throughout our lives. There are indulgences into addictive substances. There are indulgences into temptations of lust, temptations of power, temptations of anger. There are all of these wild beasts of the spirit that we all live with. 
And yet while we sit in the wilderness, tempted by Satan, the wild beasts calling us, there are also the angels waiting on us. After this temptation and spending time with the, his wild beasts and with angels, Jesus returns to the city and says, mm, it's really time for me to believe. It's time for me to step into this. It's time for me to be who I think I'm called to be. It's time to turn to God. Now, some suggest that Mark is hearkening back to Hosea, where God makes a covenant with wild animals, or pe perhaps Isaiah and his images of a peaceable kingdom. But I wonder if Mark might be remembering the covenant God made with all creation when the waters of a great flood receded and all manner of beasts disembark disembarked the ark. God's peaceable creation is not just a good feeling in the heart. It's not a warm fuzzy. It's a world where all of God's creation lives in harmony. Jesus' baptism in Mark wasn't just a symbol of ritualistic cleansing. It was a symbol that Jesus was being made ready to show us how to live at peace with the rest of creation with our wild animals, with all wild animals, with our demons and all. It seems humans have a hard time remembering that we share the world with the rest of God's creation. It seems we humans all too often live in shame that we carry when we've succumbed to our temptations. We don't have to look too far to see that living with this kind of shame leads us to living in ways that are out of harmony. It doesn't, we don't have to look far to see that when we indulge the wild beasts of temptation, that we live out of harmony with the rest of creation. Habitat loss due to deforestation brings displaced wild animals into contact with domesticated animals, resist, resulting in new pathogen exchange and the rise of coronaviruses. That seems to ring a bell. <laughs> the Living Planet Report of 2020 published by the World Wildlife Federation told us that on average, of the 4,300 vertebrate species they study, that, that from 1976 to 2016, all of them had declined in, on average by 68%. In the American tropics, including the Caribbean and Latin America, population sizes de decreased, by, of, of wildlife decreased by a staggering 94%. The United Nations published a sweeping report in 2019 cautioning that one million of the estimated eight million plant and animal species on the planet are at risk for extinction. And many, not within centuries, but within decades because of our actions. I could go on, but you know what I'm talking about. Just three years ago, all 268,597 square miles of Texas was crashed, crushed by a blizzard, and, and everyone spent two and a half years dodging a germ as a result of COVID-19. Some say that the Arab Spring was the first war that was caused by cl climate change with the migration of people into the cities because they could no longer grow things in the countryside. More people are on the move today than ever in recorded history because of rapid climate change. We're out of harmony, folks. This is our first Sunday in Lent, our annual reminder that we are not God. It's a time when we are invited to shed those habits, those attitudes, and things that keep us from meeting the holy and standing in awe. 
Now, during the time of pandemic, we often talked about when things get back to normal. And perhaps things should never get back to that normal. The previous normal got us into a place in which we we find ourselves today. What are the temptations that we must eschew so we can be at peace with the rest of creation? What are our wild beasts that must be tamed? What temptations must we reject to protect not just ourselves, but all of creation, animals, domestic and wild, and all the birds of the air? What are the the temptations that we indulge that keep us from seeing that the time has been fulfilled And that if we open our eyes and live in harmony, God's beloved community is upon us. During this pilgrimage to the cross, I pray that we all may feast on the unity of life and fast from our ways that divide and endanger all of us. What beliefs do you hold close which do not allow for communion with others and the rest of creation. Perhaps it's time to rethink and release those. You know, this happens. We've done it as a nation even. Our nation at one time thought that a black man was but three-fifths of a person. And a black woman She didn't register. It took a long time, but we gave up that notion. And we still have pain from that that lingers. But it's worth exploring, after all, because if God can change God's mind, shouldn't we be able to change our minds as well? Shouldn't we be able to change our ways of interacting in the world? Shouldn't we be able to tame those wild beasts? God's covenant and Jesus' sacrifice have been made, and it's up to us to follow those symbols and live into what's been prepared for us. That's it. That's it. So let us decide what we will take up during this season of Lent. And let us decide what we will let go. Amen.